Ultimately, what the coil driver does is it gives you huge constant power speed range, which is to say we hit peak power very early on, and then that peak power is maintained all the way out to maximum RPM. And that's actually quite difficult to do with, with a normal three-phase motor. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Eric Husted, uh, the CTO here at XRO. So fundamentally, it's a drive that, that switches the machine between two different um, coil configurations. Um, in our case, series and parallel, but um, you know, principally what that means for the machine is it, is it changes the, uh, the current density and the voltages produced by the machine to allow us to optimize it for um, different operating regions. Like for example, at low speed, where you want a lot of torque, um, you know, we would switch into series mode where we're producing a lot of current density in the machine, which is generating a large amount of, of low end torque. Um, and then as the machine speed increases, the voltage it produces increases, in which case we switch into parallel, which allows the machine to continue operating at, at high speed without sacrificing performance. So it gives you the benefit of, of, of a very torque dense machine without sacrificing high speed power. So more or less best of both worlds. The coil driver is it's, it's really interesting in the sense that it, it gives you, first of all, a couple more degrees of freedom in your system optimization. Um, and it's a, a powertrain system that allows you to now optimize the machine more for torque density, right? So there's, a, there's also magnetic optimizations that happen in the machine. So if you want this motor to produce torque and then be able to produce power at high speed, you, you do have to make some sacrifices, right? Because you need to be able to field weaken at, at very high RPM. So magnetically, um, that kind of constraints, if you want a very broad constant power speed range, you have to make some uh, magnetic uh, design choices that kind of limit torque density, limit power density. Whereas with a coil driver, we go straight from maximum torque density um, and maximum power density at and while sacrificing essentially constant power speed range because what we can do is we shift gears now, right? So we have two electrical gears in there, so we can build a highly torque dense, highly power dense motor, um, which what that means, of course, is it produces a pile of torque, but it doesn't do that over the entire speed range. It, it essentially stops producing torque at, at, you know, as the RPMs climb um, because of the sacrifices you made in the magnetic circuit to, to get it to produce the torque. Now, when we change the windings, um, kick it into second gear, as it were. Um, we don't have to worry about the fact that our constant power curve isn't as constant as maybe a lot of people would aim for if they're building a, a three-phase system. So um, and this is how kind of we, we can do smaller machines because we're aiming for, for high torque density, and then we use the, the, the electric gearing to get around the sacrifice that you make in that respect, which is the constant power range. So ultimately what the coil driver does is it gives you huge constant power speed range which is to say we hit peak power very early on, and then that peak power is maintained all the way out to maximum RPM. And that's actually quite difficult to do with, with a normal three-phase motor. Um, so on the motor, you do have to have you know, um, some changes made on the machine to, to, to essentially give us access to those coils. Um, so essentially, we, we integrate into the machine a lot deeper in terms of a, as a magnetic component as part of our power electronics architecture. Um, and then how does it work? It essentially takes those coil groups in and, and either drives them um, in series, right? So we connect the coils in series uh, and dump current into it or, or we switch them into parallel and, and push the current in. And the fact that we have all of the switching architecture built into the drive itself gives us, first of all, it reduces the cost dramatically over, over how, you know, because coil switching is not new, right? It, it's been around for quite a while. People have tried to do it. I'm not tried, they've succeeded in the sense that it works, but it's, it's not commercially feasible because of a huge amount of cost involved in, in building the switching architecture. So us bringing kind of the drive and the, and the switching architecture into one package allows us to um, basically reduce the amount of redundant silicon in the system, which reduces the cost. And then it also gives us a lot of other benefits from a, from a very sort of deep electronics perspective in the sense that we have a lot of freedom in terms of, of how we control the switches and, and that then translates to essentially lower um, ripple currents inside the drive, uh, lower terminal currents, um, which you know, serves to further reduce the cost of, a, of a, you know, how you would do it with a normal three-phase drive. Well, if it's a three-phase machine, it'll come with three leads. Um, 
but fundamentally inside the inside the stator, um, you know, it's it's lots and lots of little coils that are kind of configured in, in various combinations of series and parallel um, to to give you the machine performance that you're looking for, right? Because you know, a typical stator might have 48 slots or 72 slots, uh, in which case you're going to have you know eight number you know, a certain number of coil groups per phase, depending on the number of slots and number of poles. Um, and then, you know, in the stator, you would bring those groups of coils together to then make, you know, one coil that the, the motor drive sees, which then gets connected in star or delta, which then comes out on the three leads. So all we do is we essentially take the same machine, um, take those coil groups inside the motor, um, you know, bring out them as individual coil groups so we can then uh, switch them on the fly and do what we need to do with them. Because we break the machine into a bunch of coils um, and then address them individually and you know we have a fairly complicated parallelotronics architecture in there now that essentially allows us, so it essentially becomes a universal power converter. Uh, it's not necessarily just AC fast charging, we can plug solar panels into it, it'll take a solar panel input, run MPPT and charge a battery directly off a solar panel, which if you think about that, right, you just have a solar roof, you don't need a, your, your solar inverter, you don't need anything else, it just goes into the vehicle, you can charge straight off the, off the solar panel. And, you know, one plausible thing. But essentially what we're doing is we're utilizing the, the magnetic component of the machine and the power electronics for as many different things as we can, which is, you know, basically, it, it's a multi-tool. Um, it'll drive the motor if we wanted to, it'll charge off single phase if we wanted to, it'll charge off three phase if we wanted to, it'll charge off, off DC if we wanted to, like solar panels or micro hydro or whatever you want to do. Um, it'll, it'll push back onto the grid because it's fundamentally bidirectional. So we can discharge the battery into the grid if you want to run it as a backup for your house or you know, if, you, if you have a fleet operator that's running school buses that are you know, sitting stationary for the vast majority of the time, they can act as energy storage. Um, if you're on a remote site and you happen to have a hydrogen fuel cell activate, you know, running into your vehicle, you can do remote power. You, know, you can drive your truck, I don't know, somewhere into a farm or wherever whatever you can think of, mining, who knows. Um, but then the, once the vehicle's stationary, um, it'll deliver three-phase power to your whatever application you might need. So if you have a remote worksite, maybe military applications could be a perfect example, right? Forward operating base, drive your truck out there, you have a hydrogen fuel cell, and then you can power your base off that vehicle when it's not moving. Um, so there's a lot of just possibilities, I think, when you, when you use your imagination what you can do with the system. And it's all essentially enabled by the fact that we've now broken the machine down and are able to utilize its magnetic components for something other than making torque. Yeah, so you would, you would lose the, the three-phase drive for starters. Um, if you're talking high voltage systems, you know, because we also have the, the direct grid tire capability, you would get rid of your onboard charger. Um, and you know, if, if the infrastructure catches up and the various safety standards catch up and we can get you know, three-phase good connection to the vehicle, um, your DC fast charging infrastructure goes away. So from a, from a societal perspective, um, the amount of energy we have to expend to manufacture all of this infrastructure, right? Because at the end of the day, um, that's what we have to do. You know, if we build a DC fast charger, we've got to go and refine the materials, we've got to assemble them, we've got to build all the stuff, and that, that's at the end of the day is, is, is energy, right? Um, so if we want to think about it, if we need to change over our entire transportation network, to become electric, right? The less stuff we have to build to do that, the better. So if we don't have to build the DC fast chargers, right. um, and we can just tie into the existing AC grid, um, then that, that, that's just a huge chunk of stuff that we don't have to build to electrify um, our transportation. So yeah, so basically the coil driver means you don't need the onboard charger. If the regulations catch up, or when the regulations catch up maybe is a better way to put it. Um, you know, you don't need a DC fast charging network, um, so your vehicles can just charge off any AC outlet, any three-phase outlet. Um, and then, you know, there's an opportunity to, to, to optimize the electric machine, make it a little bit smaller. Maybe you want to get rid of your rare earth magnet, which I think is a, you know, a, a great thing. I kind of don't like magnets anymore after I've spent time thinking about it. Um, you know, so you get rid of the rare earth, you maybe go induction machines and, and, and or synchronous reluctance. Um, so it, it changes the you know the, the cost and the supply chain structure of the of the electric motor, so that you know you don't have to go and buy rare earth from China, um, and 
sort of more nuanced things like if you get rid of those magnets, you know, the machine's no longer excited, which make, makes the whole safety stuff a lot easier to deal with, right? If the, if the drive shuts down with the vehicle moving, a permanent magnet motor will sit there and quite happily continue making voltage, which is a bad thing. Three-phase drives have been around, I don't know, since semiconductors were more or less created, I'd say, let's say the 70s, right? Um, and there has never really been um, a feasible way to move away from that. So basically everyone's just kind of settled into this, this you know, three-phase drive is how we do electric machines. Um, so, you know, uh, what we've come along is, is we've said, well, not necessarily. So we're going to, you know, we've taken, it's still a three-phase motor. I mean, technically it could be any number of phases, but we, we still work with three-phase machines. But we sort of said, you know, there's more to this that, that we can do. So, you know, and especially when it comes to electric vehicles, you know, where you really have huge discrepancy in the requirements. You know, you, you want this thing to be quick off the line and, and very peppy at, at low speed. So when you're driving in the city, you know, doing, taking off from traffic lights or whatever. But, you know, you also then, comparatively speaking, you want to be able to sit on the highway at, you know, 110, 130 kilometers per hour. Of course, assuming that's legal. Let's say you're in Germany where, you know, you might want to sit at 200 kilometers per hour. So that the, you know, that, that's a huge ratio of speed. So if you want a machine that does the torque at low speed to feel quick, um, but then also be able to cruise at the highway speed efficiently with enough power to do so, um, it's, it's quite challenging from a machine design perspective. You invariably end up with essentially very large machines to be able to hit both the torque and the high speed power. Um, of course, we come along and say, well, no, we can do that with a smaller motor. Um, and we can give you a very broad constant power speed range because when you sort of look at, like, you know, you ask about what, what makes up a vehicle, right? You have the battery, you have the drive, and then um, the motor. Um, now, of course, there's the rest of the vehicle, which were, you know, wheels and chassis and all that sort of stuff. But one of the things that happens is the battery essentially constrains the system, right? Both in terms of the voltage it has and the amount of power it can deliver. So what really you want for, for a vehicle is you want to be able to use the full power of the battery as soon as possible. So that you look at something, you know, common electric vehicles, they don't reach actually their peak power until you're doing like 70 kilometers or 80 kilometers per hour because the, the way the machines are designed is, um, you know, the, the, essentially when you're in, in, in constant torque region where the torque curve is flat, you know, power is increasing linearly. So when you're at zero speed, you have zero power. And then as the vehicle speed increases, you, you start consuming more power with constant torque. Of course, what the coil driver will do is it'll bring a whole lot more torque in earlier which means you reach your constant power way quicker. And then, because the battery can't deliver anymore anyway, so then you end up with a very broad constant power speed range as the vehicle speed increases. So you've just got um, essentially constant power available from you know, 20, 30, 40 kilometers per hour rather than 70 or 80 kilometers per hour. And then, so that means a couple of things you can do, you know, um, you can make vehicles feel very, uh, the drivability of the vehicle increases, so you can have you know, a vehicle that feels very responsive, yeah. but you don't need a thousand horsepower to do so, right? You can do it with three or four hundred horsepower or even less. Um, so uh, the, the, the sort of the brute force approach, if you will, for EVs these days is, is just huge amounts of power to get that drivability at low speed and, and the, at high speed, but then you know, it's essentially oversizing the system just to be able to meet both of these requirements, which we don't have to do with a coil driver. three main variables I guess you play with is machine volume, the geometry of that machine, the amount of current that you want to put at this thing, and then um, the power available from the battery. So of course, more current the inverter is capable of delivering means it's actually way oversized. Like if the battery is capable of 250 kilowatt, but you have a 1,000 amp inverter, that can actually probably you know, do four or five times the power that the battery can deliver. So those are the kind of the three variables that you play with when you're designing a, a battery electric system main ones, right? There's also temperature and a bunch of other stuff. But um, now with a coil drive, you have one more degree of freedom. You now have two different coil configurations that you can play with. So now you no longer um, have to really juggle huge inverter versus high power at high speed. So if you want the power at high speed and the torque at low speed, you need more current, right? So we give you that with less current, essentially, because we're able to put the machine in series, which generates a higher slot current density. Um, which is ultimately what makes torque, right? The motor doesn't care about the phase current. It cares about the current, the number of charge flowing in the slot. Um, so we, we can do, what we essentially do is we add turns, right? When we put in series, we have twice as many turns as you do in parallel. 
when the machine increases in speed, you know, so you have the first portion of, of, the, of the operating region of the machine is, is, is what's known as the constant torque region, right? That's where the inverter is in, or the coil driver or whatever system is delivering the current is essentially in current control mode. So what it's doing, on well not current control, current limit, right? So, so an inverter will have two kind of constraints built around it, the amount of current it can deliver and the amount of voltage it has available. So when you're in the constant torque region, what that means, because torque is directly proportional to current, what that means is the inverter is in constant current mode. So you're not running out of voltage at that point. You're, you're just driving constant current into the motor and it gives you constant torque right up until the time speed reaches a point where the induced voltage or the back EMF of that motor reaches the DC link voltage, which is to say now the inverter no longer can deliver that current without doing some trickery with the motor, right? which is called field weakening, where we now start adding angle to advance the current in, in terms of the, the rotor position, um, which, which essentially starts putting um, current into kind of somewhat cancel the, the flux linkage in the machine, and that's essentially what field weakening is. is you're, we're using some of the inverter current now to suppress the magnet flux in the motor to reduce the amount of voltage it produces to allow the machine to spin faster. Of course, this current that we're putting in is, is, is not producing output, right? So what it's doing is it's, it's, it's field weakening, but that, that D-axis current is what it's called. It's, so the D and Q-axis, Q-axis produces torque, D-axis produces uh, is the flux axis. Um, so now we're, we're canceling magnet flux, so we're putting current into the stator that cancels the magnet flux, but it doesn't actually make the torque. And of course, any current flowing in the stator generates I squared R loss. So now what we're doing is, to be able to have these machines operate at high RPMs to deliver power, it means you need a lot of D-axis current to field weaken the machine to the point that it can operate there. Um, and that D-axis current generates I squared R loss in the motor. Um, so when we're in parallel mode in, with the coil driver, because the machine is producing less voltage, means we don't need to feel weaken. So what that means is we're able to run the machine at much higher RPM before we have to start adding the D-axis current, um, which means the current that's going into the machine is producing torque, nothing else, which is where the efficiency comes from. Right? As soon as we start adding D-axis current, we're burning heat in the stator, but that doesn't actually add output. It just kind of allows the machine to operate. So that, that's where the efficiency is coming from. So the height, the, the the increase in efficiency in parallel is not magic, it's just what happens when you, know, you don't have to feel weakened. When you think about range anxiety, like to me, I mean, if I was thinking about it, I, I'm not concerned about an electric vehicle range for doing errands around town, right? I mean, if the average, average EV has, what, two, three hundred kilometers range, let's say, right? That's more than enough for me on a daily basis to do to drive to and from work and maybe run whatever errands. I mean, I I, I don't think I've ever driven more than, you know, on an average day more than like 50 or 60 kilometers a day, right? So that's not the issue. The issue is road trips or if you want to go on a long distance drive or something like that, right? So, um, and that that's kind of where the coil driver will actually really come into its own is because of the high speed efficiency that it brings in. So, um, so when you're cruising on the highway at a fixed you know, 110 or whatever the speed limit is, um, that's where you're spending a lot of time at a relatively high power rate because as the vehicle is moving through the air at 100 kilometers per hour, you have wind resistance, you have to constantly overcome quite a lot of work. Whereas with the, when you're in the city, you've got, you know, you do have some friction losses, but it's, it's, it's you know, velocity squared relationship with, with, air lo uh, with air friction, for example. But like in a, in, a, in, a, in a city, you know, a lot of start and stop, you're recovering energy, um, and I don't think really range is that much of an issue, right? I mean, two or three hundred kilometers, I don't know if I'd want to do three hundred kilometers worth of errands in one day. Um, but if I'm driving on the highway, I'm going to do six, seven hundred kilometers a day. Um, and I'd like my vehicle to go as, as far as possible. So all of a sudden, highway mileage is essentially what the coil driver gives you. It's because you're now sitting at a high RPM, high power region where the, the machine can be up to 10% more efficient because of the, the field weakening. So, um, and that's kind of what, one of the, the, you know, if you look at something like a WLTP drive cycle, that's essentially grandma going for a Sunday morning drive, uh, very slow. But then the last portion of the WLTP is where, the, where there's a little bit of highway driving, right? So the energy consumption, coil driver versus three phases, is more or less the same at the low speed stuff because the coil driver doesn't really do anything for efficiency at low speed. Um, because it's the field weakening that's where the benefit comes from, right? So as soon as you get on the highway where you actually, where I believe personally the range anxiety is coming from, right? People are worried about, you know, how far can they go on, on, a, on, on a tank 
um, when they go and visit their relatives or whatever in another state or you know going for a big road trip or whatever so that's when you're sitting in fuel weakening so the the coil driver will allow this machine to operate at that speed at the most efficient way it can and that's yeah we see big chunk improvement there for example multi-motors is done for a number of reasons not just power or torque right like uh, let's say you want an all-wheel drive car but you don't want a drive shaft running from the front to the back. You do that with two motors, right? So that, that's actually one of the nice flexible things about electric vehicles is, is it does allow you to, to, to do that. Now that comes with pros and cons, right? If you think about a real four wheel drive system, you have one engine and you have drive shafts that connect all the four wheels. And then if you have differential lock, then 100% of the engine power will go to any one of those wheels. Whereas if you now split that into like two E axles, for example, now you've only got half the power on the front and half the power on the back. So if you're in a low in a, in a low traction environment, you know, uh, where one of the wheels is spinning, you're, you're actually starting to lose power now because you, you're not able to move that power now to the other axles that have traction. Um, so multiple motors are done for a multitude of reasons, um, some of which is to increase power and increase torque. But that's probably coming more from, you know, if you've already designed one motor, if you want more power, what do you do? Put two motors in or design another new motor, right? And it's much easier just to take the motor and go, oh, twice as much power, twice as many motors. Um, but the, the, the design challenge that I think um, people face is you want something that is low cost, that gives you the low speed torque, and then also the power at high speed. And, and, and if you do that with a three phase drive, I mean, you kind of have to do both. Whereas, and that results in a huge amount of uh, oversizing of the system to be able to reach both the low speed torque and the high speed power, which you know, based on the battery limit, then kind of means you're essentially have a lot of excess material in there that you can't use. Because the battery will say, okay, you only have 250 kilowatts, but maybe the system is capable of like five or 600 kilowatts because you have to make it big enough to give you the torque and the power at high speed. Whereas the coil driver allows a lot more optimization and machine size to, you know, give you that constant 250 kilowatt with a much smaller geometry motor and give you the torque. First of all, you can reach the same performance envelope with, with, significantly with a significant reduction in machine size. So, which of course directly translates to, um, you know, if you're a permanent magnet motor, that directly translates to less, you know, rare earth magnets, for example, which are, you know, very expensive. And then I don't think the, the price is gonna be coming down. If anything, it's gonna go get more expensive. And secondly, um, because the way the coil driver allows you to get around machines that have poor constant power speed range, it allows you to actually now utilize um, machines which traditionally don't get a lot of traction, and excuse the pun, in, um, <laughs> in, in, in EV type applications, right? Like induction machines, because they basically, you know, they don't feel weakened very well. So they don't give you a very broad speed range. But of course, with a coil driver, we can now produce the same torque density and power density as a permanent magnet motor with an induction machine. Um, and then actually just give you the same speed range as well, because we can switch the machine into, into ser and between series and parallel. The you know the, the the magnet cost of the of an active core of a machine right the magnet is like fifty percent of the cost, so if you think about if you can produce a machine that has the same torque and power density but doesn't have that magnet cost in there, that's a, that's a, that's a big saving in terms of cost. It makes the machine infinitely more recyclable because something that people don't talk about is like when you have a permanent magnet motor and you want to recycle it, that's permanent magnets are relatively safe when you have them you know, as a single piece, but if you grind them down, the dust of those kind of elements, it's not very good for you. Um, they're very difficult to kind of gather them all back up together and recycle it in a meaningful sort of way. Whereas if you have copper and steel, you know, that everyone knows how to recycle copper and steel, that's basic, right? You just remelt it and off you go. Um, so it gives you the opportunity to use these rare earth free machines. Um, you can downsize your motor, you have a lot more, you can make low power vehicles feel very dynamic, drivable, right? So, you, so instead of having a thousand horsepower car, which is just kind of ridiculous, right? who needs I mean, a thousand horsepower is mental. That's a, yeah. Um, but you know, you can make uh, two or 300 horsepower feel really peppy. The permanent magnet machine is permanently excited because it has magnets that are, have permanent magnetic field. And if you spin that thing, it's gonna make voltage regardless of the operational state of the drive or what the vehicle's doing. Like for example, if you hook a Tesla or any permanent magnet driven car up to a tow truck and pull it, right? That motor's spinning now. And that motor's generating voltage and that's gotta be handled somehow. 
Um, some of the heavy duty trucks that companies that we've dealt with, they have to drop the propeller shaft to stop the motor being spun when they tow these vehicles because of the excitation from the machine. Now the coil driver, what it does is it increases the speed where that problem occurs, but it doesn't prevent that problem, right? That's, that's just coming from the, from the electric motor itself, from the nature of how it's built. Now if we want to talk about induction machine, that's a completely different story because the coil driver essentially enables induction machines to, to run with IPMs in terms of performance capability. But when you shut the drive down on an induction motor, the motor is no longer excited uh, and that's it. It's just off, right? It's just a spinning piece of metal that's completely safe. Yeah, so the, the, I think the, the hybrids are actually a, a great example of an extreme speed torque range requirement, right? Because, especially diesels because you have you know, high compression, you know, well, compression ignition diesel engines require a mountain of torque to turn them over. Um, you know, to the point, that's why batteries are huge on trucks, right? Because the amount of torque required to just to get the cylinders turning. Um, so that basically puts some extreme uh, broad requirements on the machine. So you need like, you know, thousand plus Newton meters to just to turn the diesel engine over. Um, and then, you know, at three or four thousand, well, not three or four thousand, but you know, two or three thousand RPM, you need to produce significant power. So you need like a mountain of torque up to 100 RPM, and then you know, 1,000 to 3,000 RPMs is generally the operating region for for most big diesels. You want this machine then also to do. I mean, if if you're just talking start stop, then that's no problem. But like, if you want to do start stop as well as actually some kind of hybrid stuff, you know, where you're using it as a as a as a either accentuate torque for the for the diesel or generate or whatever then you know, the machine required to, to do the starting and then the machine required to do the, the hybrid operation are very divergent in terms of their requirements and, 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 and the core driver fits that perfectly actually is because, um, I say that because I, you know, my, in my past life I did actually quite a lot of starter generator micro hybrid things and, and that was always a challenge is to, to, to size the inverter and the machine in a cost effective way that you know, it, it gives you the cranking torque that you need to turn the engine over and then also still actually gives you reasonable output over the, the operating region of the combustion engine. So I, I would say um, what the coil driver does is it, it is huge speed torque range. So if you have an industrial application which sits a fixed RPM, no benefit, right? Uh, marine application would probably be the same. If you're like, if you're a container ship driving across the Atlantic, um, you're sitting at I don't know, 10 knots, 15 knots, all day long. So in that case, again, not a lot of benefit there. But if you're on a, on a performance boat, like a recreational boat, where you're accelerating, and you, know, you want the thing to, to pull up onto plane quickly, I think there would definitely be a use there for sort of more of those recreational applications. Um, aircraft is, is another interesting one where actually, you know, it, it sounds like it could be a good application but it really depends on how the aircraft is done because a lot of them are done with variable pitch propellers and the, 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 the motors more or less spin at a fixed RPM. So it, it really comes down to, to the exact application of, of, the, of the vehicle. But I think land-based transportation um, and there's a few other industrial applications like for example big conveyors where you've got a huge mass that you need to get moving. Um, or machine tools is another hilarious one, right? If you think about that, like you have a CNC machine which you know has a spindle motor which needs to um, you know either spin very slowly with a high with a large diameter cutter, or has to spin very very fast with a small diameter cutter. They also actually you know would be a great application for the coil driver because in, yeah it gives you that capability within uh, within one motor. I like to think that it, it spurs a little bit of innovation because, you know, when you think about it, a three-phase drive hasn't changed since probably the 70s. They're all the same. They're all just, you know, same six switches. Maybe it's a six-phase machine, which is two three-phases stuck together. There's not a lot of, you know, imagination going into, into that, right? It's, it's more or less the, the exact same circuit repackaged into a different box with different current rating, different voltage rating or whatever. But I'm hoping that, you know, looking at the machine and the drive as kind of more of an integrated electromechanical system drives innovation, right? Because I mean, I think, I'd like to think there's a little bit more still left to be found in electric powertrains, you know, um, just because I think it would be really cool if, if that happened, because it, that makes cars interesting to me, at least anyway, it's, it's just a variety, right? If all of a sudden, they're all the friggin' same, 
then that's not very interesting. <laughs> so I was here in Highfield um, in, in the lab, and the first time I rotated a machine, yeah, we definitely, you know, had a beer or two, maybe. Um, but it was, it was very cool, you know, first of the first time it switched between series and parallel, we were like, woo, look at that, it works. And then after that, it was kind of just became normal, and, you know, we're just going through all the software development. Because, I mean, making something work on a bench is actually pretty easy. Right, but then making it ready so it's 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 you know from a safety perspective and and, and reliability perspective um, that you can put it into a vehicle and, and and let someone drive it around. I mean that, that's that's a completely different level of, of completeness of a, of a of a prototype. Oh, of course. I mean it's been you know a long hard road of, of development testing, right? Because there's there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes in terms of, you know, like, like I said, proof of concept, easy peasy. Making something that you can manufacture at a cost effective, in a cost effective way, right? So now you have to think about design for manufacturability. You need to design, you know, think about the component choices that you're putting in there from a cost perspective. You need to think about, okay, under what conditions is this thing's operating in, right? If you look at vehicles, minus 40 to plus 100 degrees. Um, the thing's getting shaken to pieces on potholed roads. It's, you know, getting driven through water puddles. Um, there's all, all the other stuff that goes into making electronics work in an environment that's really hostile to electronics, which is to say mounted onto the bottom of a truck, right, where it's driving through salty roads, salt, rain, all kinds of things that you would never want any of your electronics anywhere near. Um, that's the challenge, right? It's, it's, it's always, for automotive electronics, it's always been the problem. The electronics themselves are easy. Right. Make it reliable for 10 years plus in a vehicle under the most horrible conditions you can think of, that's the challenge. From an engineering standpoint, actually, the, 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 the challenge is, is, is not so much the coil switching. I mean, that was something that was actually pretty easy. Um, the challenge comes with just, you know, building an 800 amp, 800 volt half bridge or, or switching stage. You know, there, there's the engineering challenges that come along with developing the Powertronics architecture that, you know, takes 800 volts DC and then smashes that current on and off, you know, 10,000 times a second and, you know, eight, nine hundred thousand amps. You know, there's a lot of design that goes into making something like that work. Um, you know, the core switching, we, we proved the concept very early on. That was a, you know, we built the first prototype, um, you know, it took three or four months and then that was up and running. And then after that, it was all just the challenge of, of building a switching stage that can deliver the voltage and current that we need um, for various different voltages and different current ratings and different MOSFETs, you know, silicon carbide, silicon, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's, it's just, I would say, you know, building a reliable switching inverter, whether it's a coil driver or a three-phase drive or a DC-DC converter, I mean, there's just good old-fashioned engineering challenges there to make that work right. You know, your thermal interfaces, your inductances, and all that sort of stuff. It always will in the future, I think, at the end of the day, when you think about it, anything that's running on electricity needs power electronics. <laughs>